this is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. Hello and welcome to Born Wild Out of Africa. After a decade of traveling across the wild spaces of India and reporting on conservation issues, this year I decided to follow a personal dream. It's always been my desire to travel across the heart of wild Africa. To my surprise, many of the conservation issues, from habitat loss to poaching to the man-animal conflict, are the same. But it's the animals that are different and the approach to conservation here in Africa many times quite different. So come with me on my journey. It's a windy, golden, sunny day. A troop of baboons are around me at the Tagama National Park. They are intent upon their business and could not care less that I'm just a few meters away from them. It all seems fine, a troop of wild chakma baboons feeding on the fame boss, minding their business, and there I am, observing them. But outside of this pretty picture, the truth is that all is not well with these baboons. This is one troop of the last 300 to 350 chakma baboons left on the Cape Peninsula. Conflict with growing suburbia has left many of them dead and wounded and is endangering these last few troops. On closer examination, I notice that there are at least three maimed females in this troop. Later, I would learn their stories. before the first settler rounded the Cape of Good Hope, right here on the wild edge of Africa is the home to the Peninsula Chakmas. The unique vegetation here, the fine boss, was their main source of food. But with human development and encroachment literally onto their wild boundaries, places that were once their playing fields taken over, the Chakmas have learned to adapt to a new source of food, our fridges and our garbage, bringing them into direct conflict with us. They were here before us. But the question is, will they continue to be here now that we've come and stake to claim? Chakma baboons are found across southern Africa, ranging from South Africa, north to Angola, Zambia and Mozambique. But it's only this isolated population in the Cape that is considered threatened. They have been cut off from the rest of the baboon populations and are too close to human habitations, leading to baboon people conflict. However, it is also here that they are protected. Elsewhere in southern Africa, baboons are hunted. Here too, however, several baboons, labelled as problem animals, have been shot dead by the authorities. In my quest to understand the conflict and look for solutions that will enable us and the baboons to coexist, I met two fascinating people who are trying to create awareness and educate people about these Cape Peninsula baboons. While in Africa the baboons are not considered endangered, here in the peninsula the Chakma baboons are definitely threatened. Filmmaker Trevor de Kock, who's been filming the baboons for seven years, is hoping to use his film as a conservation tool, hoping to gather enough material to sensitize people towards these animals and also what makes them come into conflict with us. Through his firm, Trevor also hopes to make us understand the animal better, thereby increasing the tolerance for them and making us appreciate the fact that living here in Africa, it's a gift and not a curse to have wild Africa on your doorstep. <laughs> Did he just fall out of the roof? Yeah, yeah, he came out of the ceiling. <laughs> Jeez. It's often this kind of a mess that makes people very intolerant of baboons in their homes. Many residents chase away the baboons, but many also physically harm them. Residents also have dogs 
who cannot really hurt the big male baboons, but they can certainly attack and kill females and the babies. Trevor introduced me to Eric and his troop. Eric is a 22-year-old male baboon, wise to the ways of suburbia, explaining his unusual longevity. Once we found Eric lying on the top bed fast asleep, the, the, the security company claimed he was reading a book. And I actually went up there, there was a book lying around on, on the bed, so I don't know, I can't believe that. But, uh. You can see he's not his prime, you know, his coat's not great, he's a bit sort of hunched. Ooh, there you're right. It's like the he old man. He does have some marks on his face, yeah. with a little bit of bleeding. It comes fed past us here. Yeah. Eric's way. troop often raids in the area of Komiki. Here there are factories, homes and of course, garbage disposals. Baboons are one of the most intelligent animals, their intelligence helping them survive and adapt fast to their changing world. But it's also this intelligence that makes it easy for them to go through doors, windows and locks and raid and take people's food. The adults have a very good understanding of the traffic in general, but the, the, young the, the young ones are a bit like, you know, kamikazes, they fire through, you know, the traffic, they don't look. So they often rely on their parents to carry them across. They're going to go across the freeway now, huh? if you don't know. Let's just get up here. Whoa, they're crossing the freeway. Trevor even showed us the clips of a dead juvenile after a road hit being carried away by another juvenile. This is the car going too fast down a narrow street and uh, there were quite a few juveniles on the side of the road and they've got no car since that age and went straight under the car. So this is about three, four hours after it had gone down. This is like even a three-year-old, he's like a junior in the troop. He's trying to keep it up with the rest of the troop and picking it up and bringing it back to the troop. Every time he picked it up, he'd have to look around to see if there was no other male watching, you know, mm. senior male, otherwise he'd probably get yeah. dis disciplined. Baboon troops are a mix of males, females, babies and juveniles. Babies are as cherished and protected as they would be in our human societies. A baby stays with its mother for up to a year or a little more. Male babies are weaned faster and have to learn to get independent much sooner than the females. Females sometimes stay on with their mother and even help raise younger siblings. Every baboon troop has a dominant male. In this troop, it is Harry, although he does have several challengers. Eric is unusual in that he's like the venerable elder of this troop and not anymore its alpha male. Harry will have his females to mate with and other rival males in the group will try to jostle for his position. So it's a constant balance between dominance, vigilance and fighting to maintain the alpha position. If a dominant male is kicked off, it's possible that his offsprings get killed by the male that takes over. This way, he can bring the female into heat and spread his genes. This is one of the reasons that killing dominant males out of turn by either people or authorities quickly throws a troop into disarray and may result in the death of more baboons as a fallout, babies and sometimes their mothers who fight to protect them. On a drive out on the coast road towards the point, I came across a troop trying to get into a house. These baboons looked like a gang who knew what they were about. As I tried to get out of the car, a big male, the dominant one of this troop, suddenly appeared near the door trying to get in. When he realized I was not going to let him through that door, he systematically tried all the others and then climbed on top of the car to establish his dominance. I needed to make sure all the doors were locked tight and tested my back door and then moved away. Suddenly he rushed me, jumped on my back, yanked at my ponytail and then jumped off. All this happened in less than 30 seconds. He did not hurt me in the slightest and being a big male he could have hurt me if he wanted to. I replayed the scene in my mind trying to understand what it was that I had done to provoke him and the answer was simple. 
Instead of just walking away as I had started to do, I had turned towards him, placing my hands on my hips. This to him was a challenge from me and he had to show me who was boss. And as soon as he had done that, he left me alone and went about his business. The point I want to make here is that when they are on a raid and food is involved, there is potential for conflict. Most of the time they will still do nothing, but if the male feels cornered or thinks he can scare you into backing away, then he might do what he did with me. And that is often construed as an attack on people. And then people start talking about how dangerous baboons are, when actually they're far less dangerous than the average stranger you might meet on the road every day. Here you have a group of about seven to eight baboons, a troop that's trying to raid this house. It's being led by one big dominant male. In situations like this, the dominant male likes not only to claim his territory, but he likes to show who's boss. So that could make him aggressive, not at all in a violent way, but just enough to try and establish territory, to get an upper hand. So what happens in a place like this is here, the residents seem quite calm. They seem to be used to these animals. They also have two big dogs. But in many situations, that kind of aggression from the baboon side could be misinterpreted by the humans and it could lead to a conflict that often turns lethal and ugly. The owner of this house has the right attitude and frame of mind when dealing with the baboons and he has never been physically harmed by them. <laughs> yeah. All nonsense. Yes, I know what you're waiting for. You're waiting to get in. <laughs> One of our friends made this. It's a very simple device. It's just, it's like the old-fashioned uh, screen doors we used to keep flies out. That's only, right. only that's a, strong, a stronger, mesh. stronger mesh. And occasionally, not this size, but the little ones will pick their little head through there. But uh, can't fit right through. as long as you know that you've mm. got to be in, you can't just leave the doors like this. That's if right. you're inside, you see them and you just shoot them out. But the, the big males and that, they won't get, get through. No. When we didn't have these screen doors and the baboons got inside, then there's a problem. Because the dog also is protecting his area. The baboon is getting a little bit anxious, frustrated, can't get out. But then I get the dogs out, open the door, and let him get out. There's nothing. I have nothing. You've checked me out. Nothing. Pure curiosity, really, that brings them towards us. And they're as gentle as they can be. For being animals with a lot of strength who can inflict damage, they really don't. I mean, most of the conflict that happens in Cape Town, you only hear of how the baboon got shot or hurt. Mostly what they're doing is looking for food, they're searching for water, and if you can keep absolutely still, if you can ignore them and let them do what they have to do, then they pretty much leave you alone. This one's a juvenile, a youngster, so therefore definitely more curious than the adults, which is why he's behind me right now. The adults won't come this close because they know and they've learned that there's been dangerous behavior on both baboon and human side. You know, because I didn't even see it was, I mean, it was coming for the second time, so I was, I didn't even think. They just look for food, like you say, uh, they're used to people giving them food every time they come here, so when they see packets of um, food or anything in the plastics, they think that you are going to feed them, so that's the way it is.